Hello, I'm Dr. James Thomas. I'd like to walk you through how I treat vocal cord papillomas, specifically how I remove them. I'll begin by talking about why it's indicated and then how I use the tools that I use. Let's take an example case. Here we have a woman who's had recurrent papilloma. It's been removed a number of times when she was younger and she presents to me now with a hoarse voice. The voice is hoarse because the papilloma is a growth. It's growing on the vocal cord, the part of the vocal cord that actually vibrates and generates sound. And this keeps the vocal cords from coming completely together. So that she leaks air and the voice is husky. And additionally, the side that the papilloma is on weighs more. So she has a discrepancy in mass between the two sides. So these discrepancies cause diplophonia or roughness in the voice. So she wants it off to improve her voice and we also want to get it off because it's a growth and it will keep getting larger. And we want to, if possible, prevent it from coming back. While in the office the vocal cords are viewed upside down, that is with the front of the voice box at the bottom of the screen, in surgery with the surgeon sitting behind the patient looking forward, the vocal cords are viewed with the front at the top of the screen. The first thing I do to begin surgery here is perform a submucosal injection. That is, I'm going to inject adrenaline diluted 1 to 10,000 into the layer between the mucosa and the muscle. I'm trying to preserve as much normal tissue as possible, both the muscle and some of the submucosal tissue. And I want to remove the mucosa with the papilloma on it. So this injection expands that middle layer so I'm more likely to save tissue. So let's take a look at this excision. This is from about seven or eight years ago. It's with a unipulse laser. That is, it's not programmable. I am using it on a super pulse mode in a very low power setting, perhaps about two watts. And in this mode, it puts a large amount of energy in very, very briefly. And that creates very little uh, heat reaction or very, it ends up just cutting the tissue rather than burning it. And my goal here is to cut around the margin. I'm trying to cut on normal tissue right at the junction between tumor and normal tissue. First of all, you can see that the side I'm working on had previous surgery. There is ectatic or curved capillaries as compared to the other side, and that's scar tissue. Now I'm going to cut, and my goal is to get through the mucosa first, and then I'm going to grab the tumor and pull it away, uh, add, um, add some tension to it. And I'm trying to cut right on this margin. So I pull, and where I'm cutting now is where there are little fibers that uh, just pull apart and I excise the tumor. Let's compare the laser effect on two different types of tissue. Specifically, we'll start with the lamina propria, the layer between the tumor and the muscle. When I fire the laser here, the tissue which has been infiltrated by the saline and adrenaline literally just vaporizes, it disappears. These are the little microfibers in this area. So let's have a look. And let's compare this to the effect on the mucosa, specifically the interface between tumor and normal mucosa. Here when I fire the laser, and I'm actually aiming on mucosa, but one edge of the laser touches the tumor. And we can see that we get the coagulation and the char. That's because the tumor absorbs more heat than the mucosa does. Let's have a look at this closer. I finished excising the lesion by cutting through the far side of the mucosa and sending it to the pathologist. Now, the report is going to say all margins are positive, but I'm not concerned about that for two reasons. One is that I know that I cut on normal mucosa and it was only the edge of my laser hitting the tumor. And the second is that I don't decide how much to take out by the pathologist report, but rather by close follow-up to see if this recurs and catching it at an early phase if it does. So here she is at an examination about seven months after an excision. And she's noted a little bit of hoarseness or a little bit of change in her singing voice. 
And by a high definition close exam, I mean I'm using a high definition endoscope, but I'm also moving in very close to look at this area on the right vocal cord that looks like it's raised a bit. And I can use selective color imaging to try and see the detail of the vasculature and identify if this is papilloma. Then, if it is papilloma, we have the option in the office of using a laser, and in this case it's a KTP laser. I treat the vocal cords in the office by topically anesthetizing them. I drip 4% lidocaine onto them while the patient is phonating, and this creates a gargle, completely anesthetizing the vocal cords. And then a few minutes later, I can use the KTP laser, and I use it, in this case, at 15 watts with a 50 millisecond pulse width and two pulses per second. And when I move in, if I keep some distance, there'll only be enough heat transfer to ablate the vessels. And I typically do more than that, and that is I will get closer so that I'm actually coagulating the tissue. And I can even put the laser tip right against the tissue such that the tissue sticks to the tip of the laser and then I can pull that out. Either way, as long as I destroy the tissue, then that will treat the papilloma. There's very little pain with this afterwards. I typically ask the person to rest their voice for about a week if the papilloma is right on the edge of the vibrating vocal cord like this one is. And then they can go ahead and speak. And what she typically notices when she's had a treatment like this is that her singing will get clearer because the edge of the vocal cord will be smooth. Then at some interval, we'll take a close look again and see if it is growing back. In the past 10 years, technology has advanced in terms of magnification, high definition video for visualizing lesions, and in terms of CO2 laser technology. There are now programmable lasers, and what they actually program, um, while the companies talk about the design, they can cut curves or uh, circles or straight lines, the real value in the programmable laser lies in the ability to control the depth of the um, cut. And uh, while I use the DECA laser, there is also the Luminous that, uh, and they both do similar things, which is to control the depth. So now I can cut with a line and I won't go deeper than a certain amount. One of the first things I do when I put the patient to sleep and put the endoscope in and visualize the vocal cords is I pass 25 and 70 degree endoscopes in. And these give me a view around in various directions so I can see the vocal cord up close. In fact, I'll go ahead, typically pass through the vocal cords and look at the trachea, both to see if there's any disease there, such as the, uh, the papilloma spreading, but also to check the endotracheal tube cuff. I find it quite common that the cuff is overinflated and I'll have the anesthesiologist back out any fluid in the cuff until there is air leak and then fill it up just enough to create a seal so that we don't get a pressure necrosis of the trachea. The 70 degree scope in particular gives me a view into areas that are a little harder to see in the office but I look into the ventricles and look beneath the glottis and while I can see these in the office with appropriate topical anesthesia in the operating room I can get very close and can sometimes see vessels that I don't otherwise appreciate in the office. Again, given the blood supply of tumors, in particular papilloma, I like to inject diluted adrenaline, one to 10,000, beneath the tumor and the underlying tissues. Here, I've set the CO2 laser to a linear pattern, drawing a straight line several millimeters in length, and I am using the super pulse mode that is a high energy, very short duration pulse so I get mostly cutting rather than burning. And I typically set the depth for 0.5 millimeters. This is usually enough to get me through the mucosa on one or two cuts. My power setting is usually five watts. Occasionally I'll put it up to 10 watts. I gradually mark out the margins of the lesion by cutting through the mucosa. And then I will grasp the tumor and retract it medially towards the midline and this will peel and stretch that layer called the lamina propria between the muscle and the tumor. In fact here we can see that I'm able to preserve many of the blood vessels that are running through the lamina propria. In the event that I do get some bleeding 
I can switch this programmable laser to a scanning pattern. I believe they call this the cloverleaf pattern with this particular laser. And that creates a very light burn on the surface, and I can use that to coagulate blood vessels. After I remove the tumor, I again use the angled endoscopes, in this case particularly the 70 degree endoscope, to get um, a view of the margin of the vocal cords and look for any potential residual papilloma. Skill in surgery isn't just dependent on your ability to fire the laser, but it's your ability to perceive things. And equipment has come a long way. I use a microscope and the telescopes to visualize the larynx. The second thing, in addition to having the good equipment, is recording, because that's how I learn from my mistakes, when I miss something and I learn how not to miss it again. Let's take a look at this case of papilloma. We can use the 30 degree endoscope to look around and see the papilloma on the right vocal cord. And we'll use the techniques I've been talking about to uh, remove it. We'll cut around the edge and we'll peel it up and uh, take it off. And then I like to go back in again and look with the angled endoscopes at the work I've done. And when I get close to the left vocal cord, I can now see that there's papilloma that I missed. It's much more subtle than the large area of papilloma. Two plausible reasons for missing this secondary and smaller papilloma are, one, it's relative size. It's quite small compared to the papilloma on the right posterior vocal cord. And secondly, our attention is distracted by the large papilloma. We tend to look at the right vocal cord and not look closely. And because the endoscope is positioned in the left picture near the large crop of papilloma, the small papilloma in the distance on the left vocal cord is really not visible. If we compare that to the picture on the right side of the screen, when we get up close, we can still see the characteristic loops of papilloma on the left vocal cord. In fact, when we get close enough, we can see a ridge of papilloma running along the superior surface of the vocal cord. And because this area of papilloma is so thin, I use the laser in an ablative mode. That is, I just vaporize the surface of the mucosa with the papilloma on it. In summary, the overall goal is to, of course, identify the papilloma so you know to take it out. But once you do that, my general principle is to remove all of the papilloma at the first surgical setting. I do that by putting the patient to sleep, injecting fluid with adrenaline in it to expand the lamina propria or the layer between the tumor and the vocal cord muscle. I use a CO2 laser. I use the best equipment I have, the best microscope and the best CO2 laser. and for me, the best CO2 laser is one that has super pulse mode and, if possible, is programmable in terms of the depth. Then I cut through mucosa, so I'm cutting on normal tissue to remove the tumor. And much like an orange peel, I peel the tumor off the vocal cord using the laser. I expect that the pathologist is going to tell me that all of the margins are positive and I'm defining my margins by what I see under the microscope. While I'm cutting, I can identify tumor by how it behaves differently under the laser light than the normal tissue. While I'm in there, I use 30 and 70 degree endoscopes both to identify the pathology at the beginning, but to double check my work afterwards. At the beginning, I utilize it also to look at the trachea and to identify where the cuff of the endotracheal tube is and how much it is inflated so that it's not overinflated. Optimum treatment of papilloma requires diagnostic and surgical precision. I'm Dr. James Thomas.